Hello everyone, my name is Shadi Saleh. I'm the director of the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Murray to this uh, special webinar to discuss the IHME COVID-19 model specifically with applications to the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, in reality, over the last few months, there have been a uh, few models, uh, predictive models that have been generated to project the spread of COVID-19. We at the Global Health Institute have focused through an initiative that is the COVID-19 Arab Monitor on the 22 countries of the Arab region. But there is no doubt that the model that has been generated by IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation led by Dr. Murray has been the most, perhaps the most globally renowned. Uh, our speaker today is someone who uh, needs no introduction. He has been uh, cited often by the White House uh, press uh, briefings for his forecasting model that predicted uh, not only state-to-state -state impact and national impact within the U.S., but I think now the RIHME is going globally to our region, to Latin America, and to other region, uh, regions in the world. Uh, Chris is also known and recognized as founding the Global Burden of Disease Approach, which is a systemic uh, effort. Uh, uh, he is leading a consortium of more than 500 researchers from 50 countries to produce the, produce the uh, uh, GBD. So I know that all of us are waiting for, uh, to listen to Dr. Murray. So without further ado, due, uh, Chris, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Shadi. And uh, a pleasure to uh, be able to uh, speak uh, in this webinar. So I will run through the history and some of the key aspects of our model and focus in on some results for the region. So our, we started modeling COVID uh, early March and our initial goal was quite simple to respond to requests from our own hospital system uh, here in Seattle, Washington to predict the surge in patients that they were uh, concerned about. And soon after that, uh, many other hospitals in the US asked for <clears throat> similar models. And so we decided to just put out uh, uh, on, I think it was March 24th, uh, our estimates by state. And that filled a gap in the knowledge out there and was quickly used by many groups. And since then we've continued to try to both improve the model and expand the types of questions that we can answer with the model. So right now, our model, we produce many different outputs from the model. We produce estimates of true infections, not cases detected, but actual infections, deaths. We also produce estimates of antibody prevalence. Uh, we produce estimates of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and ventilator need. And then as part of this rather complicated effort to try to get a handle on what's happening uh, to the drivers of the epidemic, we are constantly looking at the data on testing, mobility, social distancing mandates, mask use, social contact rates, self-reported rates, and seasonality. More on seasonality, because that's gonna turn out to be a very big issue. And we produce a true reference forecast, a, a forecast of what we think is most likely going to happen. That's the most useful thing for hospitals and planners. But we can also use the modeling framework to address a very long list of um, alternative scenarios based on different policy options or different uh, public adherence to mask wearing and other factors. Now, to complicate matters, uh, when you have a new epidemic that there's many things we did not really fully understand at the beginning, uh, we've gone through three cycles of model development, evaluation of performance, and then revision of our modeling strategy. And the third 
part, two full loops, and now we're entering the third part where we are launching our third generation model. The first model, CurveFit, was a strictly statistical model where we fit a nonlinear curve to the shape of the epidemic. And the first results were powerfully driven by the experience in Wuhan, and then a week later or so by what was happening in Italy and Spain. And that did a rather good job of predicting the peak, but did a bad job of predicting the decline after the peak. So then right after about mid-April, we started working on our next generation model. It took a couple of weeks to get that fully operational. And then we shifted over in early May to the hybrid approach, which is a statistical model, the CurveFit model, fit to the past and then using to predict for the first eight days, and then transitioning from that point forward into a transmission dynamics, an SEIR model, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered model. And in that model, the future transmission is a function of predictors, covariates. And in, in that uh, model, there were four that we found at the time, mobility, testing, temperature, and population density. And this did a much better job, uh, in fact, is as I'll show you at the end, outperformed other publicly available models uh, in at least four week forecasts. Now we're transitioning to a very, an, an, another iteration. The only change there is how we fit the past in the next eight days. We have a better statistical algorithm called the random knot combination spline. And then we have the same SEIR model fit uh, going forward. And now we've broadened the number of predictors quite a lot to capture things that people have proposed and for which we find statistical evidence of an association. So more on that as we go through. So just to recap the steps that go into our modeling framework, we first take all the data on cases. We correct the trend in cases for the trend in testing. You don't do that in places that are scaling up testing. You get an exaggerated trend up in cases. We use hospitalizations if countries uh, or localities report hospitalizations and death to come up with a coherent time trend. We uh, fit that. We resample that to get uh, uncertainty in that. For each of a thousand resamples, we then <clears throat> translate deaths uh, from that process into infections back in time. On average, there's a 17 to 21 day uh, lag between infection and death. And so we take that into account. Once we have infections in the past, we fit an SEIR model to each of those thousand samples. We vary various uh, parameters that are in SEIR models. Uh, and we generate a thousand different models for each location. Uh, and then we look at R, the famous R, which is the number of infections caused by each infectious case, uh, and see how, how much of the variation in R in the past, or effective R, uh, is, can be explained by covariates. We then forecast those particular covariates. We then use the forecasted covariates and those relationships to predict future transmission. We use that that trajectory of future transmission or effective R to get estimates of infections and deaths. And then we last step turn infections and deaths into hospital use using a micro simulation based on observed data of the ratios of the number of people who get hospitalized, need ICU care or need a ventilator. So that's sort of the nine steps that go into the process. Now the random knot combination spline, here's an illustration starting in the US and then I'll move on to Egypt and Iran. On this panel, you see all the data that goes into our assessment of the past and the near future, the eight days into the future. The top row are cumulatives in log space. So we're showing dates along the x-axis and then on the far left panel, is cumulative log deaths. The middle panel is cumulative log cases and the far right panel is cumulative log infections. And we use those relationships to go from infections and hospitalizations and deaths into the bottom left corner. And why is this important? Well, if you just looked at cases in the middle, you'd say that there is explosive growth or steady growth in Alabama. 
But a lot of that is the scale up of testing. And so this algorithm deals with that relationship, maps the cases using the case fatality rate and how it's changing over time back into a common metric of daily deaths. And then we combine all those sources, which says, yes, there's uh, actually been a decline for a while in Alabama and a recent slight uptick, which is very different than the trend of just looking at the cases. We do that for Egypt where we don't have hospitalizations. We find this pattern of very substantial growth uh, if, in a transmission dynamics world, that rise that we're seeing in deaths and then in cases matching the rise in deaths uh, and projecting out eight days <clears throat> is very worrisome because that suggests that R is really quite high in the last three to four weeks. Now, Iran is an example of a much more complicated story in the region where we are seeing pretty steady, maybe slight increase in death and a very marked increase over the course of a month in cases. But that marked increase in cases is not translating into a marked increase in deaths. So this algorithm says that's probably expanded testing and therefore we are not detecting uh, yet a marked increase. I think we'll, the next week will be very telling because you might look at the death trend in Iran and say there's something happening there. Uh, and this algorithm, if, it, if we see the next three or four or five or six days of the death starting to go up, we'll, we'll start to respond to that signal. Now, a caveat, uh, we put a lot of focus on reported deaths because trends in cases are very, very sensitive to testing practices. Now, deaths, of course, are also sensitive to testing. If you don't have testing, you're not going to detect COVID deaths. Um, and we've done a lot of examination like others, and this is a case where the media has been out in front, both the Financial Times and the New York Times, in driving attention to examine excess mortality. We have found in examining places that have cause of death reporting on a weekly basis, evidence of huge undercounting in Ecuador. Uh, similarly, quite substantial undercounting in Peru, but nowhere else have we found uh, a, not, a, a, a systematic bias towards uh, substantial undercounting. So we've so far only corrected using excess mortality, the reported deaths and cases in Peru and Ecuador, but I'll come at, at the end or in a little bit to another approach to validating numbers, which is using antibody seroprevalence data. Now, one of the things that I think is unique in our modeling strategy is that uh, we are able to fit a transmission dynamics model to the past, uh, trend in deaths uh, very efficiently. So we are currently estimating, and each time we run a run, we're, we're estimating results for about 400 geographic units. Those are countries and subnational units where we do the analysis subnationally. And for each of them, we estimate a thousand models. So we're estimating in about, now this slide is out of date, about 400,000 models um, for each time we run a model algorithm. And so that allows us to incorporate uncertainty, uh, a far greater degree of uncertainty than I think most modeling uh, efforts. Now I mentioned we predict transmission, which in the formality of the math here is called beta t. You can think of uh, effective R as just a function of beta t Another parameter called gamma, which is the duration that you stay in the infectious box, and uh, the number of susceptibles in the population. So all those go into effective R. But beta t is, think of it as the transmission parameter. And we keep testing a wide range of covariates. And now in the model, we have found statistically significant relationships for pneumonia, seasonality, mobility, mask use, testing per capita, population density, self-reported number of contacts, air pollution, and smoking. And so those are now the set of variables. But we keep examining as the evidence accumulates, we start to find new relationships. Now, we've benefited a lot in the last two weeks from getting access to uh, two surveys that Facebook runs. Uh, Facebook is surveying a million 
people in the U.S. a week and a million people outside the U.S. every week. So this is extraordinary sample size by you know historic survey uh, uh, characteristics, but of course is skewed towards people who use Facebook. Facebook has only 3 billion or so users. And so we are not obviously, or they are not surveying the entire world's population, but it is very helpful data that gives you sufficient sample size in almost all countries to get a daily measurement of a number of key variables. Uh, this is always wearing a mask. Uh, ironically, they did not ask in the US survey about face mask use. And so we've had to use for the US a different survey platform called the premise surveys, but, and those are smaller sample size, but nevertheless give us, we think sufficient information to track mask use at the state level. Huge variation in mask use. This is responses on always wear a mask. Note that uh, the Middle East in general has lowish mask use rates compared akin to the United States and much lower than many other parts of the world at, at present. Now we have, at the beginning, when we were starting to transition to this model in mid-April, we had a very modest relationship we found in the data on transmission with temperature. And then we started to test the relationship between three variables that might be related to season. Temperature, the historic pattern of death for influenza by week, and then the historic pattern of deaths from pneumonia by week. And the pneumonia death variable, the raw data for the US, for example, shown on the left panel in logic ratio space, and on the right-hand side in the actual ratio, um, <clears throat> turns out to be enormously predictive. In fact, the seasonality pattern for pneumonia is the most powerful variable predicting transmission so far. Even more powerful, interestingly, than mobility or the number of contacts. Uh, what this means is that if seasonality is more than just a statistical correlation, if it's causally related, and of course it's very hard to establish causality, uh, then we should expect in the Northern Hemisphere some help up through till August in terms of reduced transmission, and then the reverse. Uh, and so in our longer range models, which we have not been releasing yet, uh, we see a very large return in the Northern Hemisphere. And this pattern is probably why we're seeing such extraordinary epidemics in the Southern Cone of Latin America right now, despite the social distancing mandates being in place. The other factor here that helps is testing capacity. Uh, you know, testing, tracing, and isolating is a critical strategy once you get the number of infections down to a manageable level. And testing capacity is highly variable, less than five per 100,000 in many parts of the low income world and also in some middle income countries and over 300 per 100,000 in some parts of the US, some parts of Europe uh, as, as well. So huge variation in testing. We have taken advantage also of a number of providers of mobility data that are based on cell phones. So there are uh, four groups that have been regularly producing mobility data based on app use of cell phones. Uh, some of this data is super detailed, uh, for example, from Facebook and Google. And here's examples from India and the Western Cape and South Africa of this very characteristic pattern in mobility where it dropped massively in March because of the imposition of mandates and general fear of the pandemic. And then depending on the place has been rising quite steadily. Uh, and you can see on this map where we're comparing mobility on June 11th um, to baseline pre-COVID that many parts of the world have rebounded in terms of mobility back to levels that are only 10 or 20% below baseline. There are parts of Latin America, the UK, parts of Spain, where mobility has stayed you know, 50% below baseline. But we have seen this global phenomenon of rebounding mobility, fatigue with the mandate, 
and general massive increase uh, that we're, we're observing around the world with huge consequences. And here's a, a, a blow up for the region. Now, there's a very interesting thing. We, we realize that this rise of mobility and the response of the mobility to the distancing mandates is a critical aspect of what's driving the pandemic. And so here's a diagram that I think is extremely revealing of what happened in the world. And it's a, it, we track six distancing mandates, school closures, partial business closures, full business closures, large group gathering restrictions, stay at home orders and travel bans. So on this diagram, if you put all six in place, you score a six. These are regional averages of countries. So each country is you know, at, at a particular count of one through six. But the important thing here showing the world is that everybody in the world put mandates on at the same time, basically in a two week period in March, regardless of the epidemic that they had at the time. Small or large, the mandates went on roughly the same time. And this has a lot to do with explaining why we have not seen large epidemics in South Asia, in Africa, and to some extent the Middle East yet. And as the mandates come off, as mobility rebounds, we're seeing uh, you know, a big change in that phenomenon. So we put all that together and uh, here's our, these have not been made public and these are certainly before they do become public will be substantially revised in various ways. But as a, as a first pass, here's our forecast for every country in the world aggregated up uh, through to October. And what we see in this uh, is really quite alarming. Uh, we find that uh, the, there was a sort of, if you will, during the period of global lockdown, despite the lockdowns, the places that locked down late had considerable mortality. Thus, we have 350,000 deaths to date. But now as the world relaxes those mandates, we expect the, the nature of the disease to start to manifest and we will see very large expansions potentially into millions of deaths uh, by October. Uh, this is showing three and a half million deaths by October 1st. I think by the time we release these publicly, those will be revised down somewhat, but generally the message is the same, is that we are now entering a much more alarming phase with a huge epidemic unfolding in Brazil and other parts of Latin America that will be difficult to get under control, particularly in the more southern areas where seasonality is working against you. And then we see this large epidemic that's also going to unfold in uh, South Asia and somewhat in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now for the region, uh, <clears throat> here's our first pass. I think these will be revised before we publicly release them. But generally, we are seeing uh, quite a substantial uptick starting in mid-July and expect to see potentially up to 300,000 deaths by October 1st with um, you know, very disturbing trends in Saudi Arabia and Egypt right now, as you can see in, in some of the results that I was showing earlier. Okay, a little bit about how our model can be useful. I think the primary purpose we see for our model is to help plan for that surge. Uh, and so that's one strategy, because clearly we think the pressure on health service providers is really going to dramatically increase uh, beginning uh, in the coming weeks, particularly in July and August but it's also going to be a tool that can help think through um, alternative control strategies uh, for trying to dampen out the impact of, of the epidemic. As Shadi mentioned at the beginning, uh, our model has been used in a number of policy contexts uh, by the White House in particular. And, uh, you know, I think the lesson there on the White House is that we had argued that if essentially if we had followed the New Zealand model and kept social distancing rigorously in place for a prolonged period, we could have gotten the, tr the transmission down to a very low level. That did not happen in the US uh, and relaxation in the US started late April. And so we have a much more prolonged epidemic. Uh, 
and then starting in the fourth week of August, we think the epidemic second wave will start with numbers starting to go back up again. Uh, the model is being used also by the European Commission and also used by a number of countries around the world. What's coming next? And then we can open it up for questions. So today we're releasing our US results to October 1st. We will be revising and making some further changes to what I showed you on the slides, but expect to release next week our uh, country specific estimates for all locations. And from here forward, we will be uh, putting out a four month uh, window. And then we are also releasing in the near future, probably next week, our more formal evaluation of forecast accuracy. And then we will also be uh, working on alternative scenarios uh, about both individual choice, mask wearing, avoiding contacts, as well as uh, alternatives that governments may consider like pulse mandates, putting the mandates on, putting them off, ways to manage the economic turmoil and the public health effects. Now, on the model evaluation, one way is to look at our model uh, and look at the forecasted antibody prevalence to actual measured prevalence. So here's a comparison of all the national studies that we've been able to find, and then one from uh, a state level study in Brazil. Now, this data on antibody seroprevalence is not used in our modeling at all. And so what this comparison shows is that essentially modeling from death using the infection fatality rate that we've estimated, we uh, are quite accurate in getting seroprevalence right. So this is a, a nice sort of short internal consistency test that our construction of the epidemiology all works uh, because we have this independent information on antibody prevalence that matches what is implied by death and infections. Now, what about our accuracy into the future? Well, we've been a, a small external group that's been working with us, has been evaluating uh, the performance of our model and the other publicly available models. And the criteria here is people who post their results back in time and not just the current estimate and uh, model for at least uh, more than one country. So that turns out to be about six, uh, and I'll show on the next slide uh, th those, but here is the a group at MIT, the Los Alamos labs, an individual called Yu Yang Gu, and then our two generations of the model, the Kerfit model and the hybrid model. And you can see our current forecasts and then median error. And probably the one that's the most interesting to look at is the one at the bottom, which is the errors uh, by week. Uh, so these are weekly errors. And then you can see why on that diagram we uh, shifted from the Kerfoot model because soon after the peak, we started to consistently underestimate uh, the number of deaths by week, as you can see in the far right. And that's why the IHME hybrid model has now does actually r rather well. Yu Yang Gu's model is all over the place uh, and gives numbers that are too high or too low. And then Los Alamos uh, and the MIT group sort of are do, do well, but seem to consistently overestimate. Here's a more formal assessment overall. This is error at four weeks, both in terms of the weekly death estimate and the cumulative death estimate. And here we've added to this diagram the Imperial College models. Uh, and you can see, first observation, you know, we've only been releasing for high income Latin America and Central and Eastern Europe. And there our error rates at four weeks are the lowest of the of publicly available models. But notice that for some parts of the world, uh, the available models do rather poorly a month out with, you know, I think the worst models to date have been Imperial and MIT for other countries with Los Alamos doing slightly better, but still very large errors uh, a month into the future. And, you know, we'll have to see as we start to release for other regions, if we can do any better for, for those regions. Um, but even for the ones where there's a more head to head comparison, uh, you can see the, the performance around different models. And I'll uh, stop there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll end with this last slide, which is the sort of big picture of what's happening in the world.
I think the way, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now as to the mystery of why there's been low transmission in South Asia and Africa. But there's a simple explanation for this, and I think it's what we're seeing in our models, uh, that the world put the mandates on at the same time in March, and those mandates went on in South Asia and Africa when there was very little local transmission. And that was, uh, the surprise was those mandates were quite effective in those settings. Now that the mandates are coming off, we're starting to see the slow steady increase in transmission. Uh, and so we should not be surprised that this next phase of expansion is going to lead to potentially very large numbers, accelerating burden uh, with, you know, death numbers in the millions. And we, because of the strong seasonality effect, we expect in places above 20 degrees latitude in the Northern Hemisphere that there is going to be um, a a strong resurgence and that unfortunately either countries in the above 20 degrees will have to, will choose to not reimpose mandates and then we'll have much larger outbreaks than what we observed in March and April, or they will have to reimpose mandates uh, and suffer the economic effects, which could be much larger a second time round with many businesses, you know, still on the margin of bankruptcy. And so a further reduction in consumer spending may have an even bigger effect than the last, the first cycle. So extremely difficult choices ahead for uh, the countries um, actually in, in all parts of the world. So I'll stop there. Uh, very sobering, I know, but let's open up for, uh, over to you, Shadi, and, and questions. Thank you, Chris. As always, it's interesting and informative. Uh, the end of your presentation wasn't very promising for humankind, but I think this is, this is what the numbers are showing. Uh, so we will open it up for uh, Q&A, and I will start off by a question that is specific to our region. Uh, so in our region, because of the variability in testing, you have indicated that the model is using more uh, deaths, rates of deaths. Now for a region where vital statistics is not as uh, uh, the sources, uh, or in general vital statistics data is not as clean or accurate as in the US or in Europe. How are you doing that uh, how, or how are you taking that into consideration? Well, this is a really big issue. So for example, in India, even though we're forecasting really quite dramatic numbers, you know, in the next four months in India, there is two bits of evidence that suggests that India may have substantially undercounted death and cases. So people have been monitoring burial sites and comparing it to a year ago, same time, and they're finding a 300% increase in burials in some parts of Maharashtra and Gujarat. Uh, and that number of, of the deaths, the excess deaths, only about a quarter are registered uh, or known COVID cases. So if you compare that to Europe, uh, what it suggests is maybe about uh, one death in three being reported. And then similarly, the antibody testing, uh, compared to what our model would predict, the, the one survey that's been conducted suggests about three times as high antibodies as we are suggesting from their observed deaths. Both bits of evidence suggest substantial under-registration. We know it occurs, Ecuador, Peru as examples. So really the only strategy in countries where there is not good vital registration, because you know one strategy is to do the excess mortality assessment, is to go and collect a, a random sample antibody survey with a good assay with high specificity, because that's the critical part. Um, and then one can back calculate from that if you do a reasonable survey with high specificity uh, what the under-registration is. 
Thanks, Chris. Now, now we're taking, we'll take a few questions from participants. I will start off by a question that is also uh, uh, relevant to the region. So uh, the uh, participant is asking whether the model itself can be applied in humanitarian settings specifically or conflict settings, uh, specifically examples such as uh, Syria and Yemen and other countries? Well, you know, we try. Uh, and the issue there in conflict settings is both the, you know, the data may be more likely under registered. Uh, so we may get undercounts there. And Secondly, the, some of the, the data that's coming in in terms of driving the epidemic, like mobility or contact rates, where the, the, data, the raw data that we're using uh, is coming from cell phone use or smartphone use, I should say, may really be a, a skewed sample. But yes, I mean, we, we can apply it anywhere. The question will be what the, the tendency may be to underestimate. Now, having said that, the, the natural problem with transmission dynamic models is historically they tend to overestimate. And we see that in the performance metrics. For example, the Imperial College models are, you know, th those errors, which I showed the absolute error, but they're all on the positive side. People tend to overestimate uh, in most cases um, because of the nature of an infectious disease transmission process, when you model that out, it's very easy for it to explode. And so that's really the, the risk here is essentially overestimation. And part of that is that the, the, the key question you have to ask is how will people respond when things get worse around them? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think we could easily get it wrong uh, in, in, in those sort of fragile state or, or uh, settings. Okay, so we have, Chris, we have quite a few questions. So if you can give us uh, short answers just to accommodate as much as possible. For the participants, I just want to make, uh, uh, make a comment that, that we, this will, the, the whole presentation will be available uh, for uh, download and I believe on the YouTube channels of both IHME and the Global Health Institute at AUB. Another question actually is, uh, uh, is uh, from Lebanon. They're asking whether you can comment in the, on the issue of asymptomatic persons possibility of infecting others since WHO just gave a statement that it is very rare. Does the data uh, show us, uh, can it show us any, any trends there or associations? Uh, very difficult to answer that. I think most people uh, who have looked at, at what limited evidence there is think there is uh, transmission from asymptomatics. I'm, I'm not sure where WHO was coming up with the idea that there wasn't. And I think they have since retracted that statement. Okay, another, another question is, what about uh, countries and communities that uh, have opted for herd immunity uh, based on the data that we're getting from those countries? Would, would there be another surge of uh, cases and deaths, sir? I, I, I believe they're particularly uh, talking about Sweden, perhaps. Well, you know, herd immunity is just a polite way of saying you're going to let, uh, you know, mo all the people who were going to die, die. Uh, you know, that there's, there is no, all herd immunity means is you let the infection rip through the population and take the consequences. So, uh, you know, it's a funny term uh, in that sense because uh, it, it just, it, it's equivalent to just sort of failing to do anything about the epidemic. And I think now we're seeing the recriminations in Sweden as they were let, really being misguided by a model, uh, a model effort that had the wrong infection fatality rate. They were being told that somehow miraculously Sweden was having very little, you know, much higher death than others, but relatively low death and somehow accumulating a lot of, uh, you know, uh, infections.
at some point they were claiming, you know, three weeks ago that 25% of Sweden was uh, immune. And then as the data has come in and as other models like ours, you know, the number is more like 5% or 6%. So no, uh, herd immunity is not really a strategy. Um, and yeah, stop there. Okay, so another question now from Egypt. They're asking whether in the models, uh, was there the predictors for death? Was that different in, in different regions? Or, what, you know, the, the, uh, the coefficients, if, if I may say, were similar all across the world? So we allow some of the coefficients to vary by location. So, for example, the relationship between cell phone recorded mobility and transmission is uh, location specific or country specific. Others, such as seasonality, we believe are more biologically driven. And so we don't let those vary. Uh, and so, you know, it's a mixture of letting the model vary the uh, relationships where we think there's a behavioral part that will vary culturally or by that location. Like what, Chris? Well, the main one we allow is, oh, well, there's two. We allow mobility, which is a, a key driver. And then we also build into the model a sort of grab all, you know, characteristic that says, is that location different than all others? It's a random intercept in the transmission model. And so those are the two that, that we, in the, in the publicly released model, we've tested many others. Uh, we also, in the sort of next tier down modeling, for because, you know, we have the main model, but when we predict future transmission, future contact rates, and future mask use, we allow those relationships that drive that to be country specific as well. Okay, another question from Pakistan. They're asking about how confident are you uh, uh, regarding the quality of input data into the model that are country specific. Is there, you know, is there, I'm going to add to that, is, are there sort of measures where you would say that the input data in this country are, you know, golden uh, versus other countries where we're doing more of a modeling? You know, it's the exact same issue that we're seeing in India. Uh, we've, we have a number of collaborators in Pakistan. We've been talking to them in detail. Uh, the message that we're receiving from uh, colleagues in Pakistan is they don't think there's that much under registration. But the only real way to get a handle on that is to go and do a random sample antibody survey because it's extremely hard to get a handle on this. Uh, I think we're seeing, you know, as, as relaxation starts, uh, we're starting to see the numbers take off in Pakistan. And it may be a very similar story to what we're seeing unfold in India. Okay. Question actually from the U.S. So the question is saying that some U.S. states, specifically as an example, Montana, have recently had low rates of transmission. So in such states, do you expect a resurgence in the fall for, this, for those states as well? So no, I do not expect much of anything to happen in Montana. Uh, I think, you know, there's in some ways, I tend to think of the first two months of what we've been observing in the last, particularly in the month of May, as mobility has shot up as a stress test on the potential for transmission. And some remote state, I mean, some, you know, much more rural states, Wyoming and Montana, Alaska, uh, are examples where we have not seen much transmission, with little exception on fisheries in, in Alaska more recently. But no, we don't really expect that that's going to, that those fundamentals will change a lot. And in our models, we see a small uptick. Uh, we, we also have been running models to January for the U.S., uh, but we don't really see a, a very large epidemic in Montana, uh, even into the winter. An interesting question from Turkey, Chris. So they're asking you, and I think this is dear to your heart. So they're asking you whether you're getting enough local data support from your volunteer collaborators of the GBD. 
Or, well, we're certainly getting a lot of help from our GBD collaborators. Uh, the part of data that would be super helpful uh, in improving the estimates is daily hospitalization rates. The reason that's such a useful indicator is whereas the trends in cases are very hard to interpret because of who gets tested and active screening in some places versus not, we think the trends in hospitalizations represent a much more consistent benchmark of severity. And, you know, sadly, the international health regulations as currently being implemented by WHO don't require countries to report hospitalizations, uh, and yet it's a, it's a really useful source. And then another thing that's very helpful as we go forward, particularly as more countries, hospital systems coming under stress, is a bit more accurate assessment of available hospital beds, ICU beds, ventilators. Um, and then the last one is if anybody is doing random sample surveys for antibodies, that can, we can use that to calibrate the models for under registration. Okay, a question from Spain. Uh, how do you explain the poor prediction of serology in Spain? I'm not sure if you are, I, you know, you, you can remember all of that, but the question is there. How can you predict, explain the poor prediction of serology in Spain? Uh, well, we actually think the prediction of serology is pretty good, except for one location, La Rioja, uh, and pretty much others, exactly line up on the 45 degree line. So I'm not sure what the, the, the questioner is thinking about, but our, we were very surprised how in super accurate it was for Spain, except for the one exception of La Rioja. Small place, not really sure if that's, you know, a sampling error on, on either side. A question from Bahrain. Do you think that there's a chance of over-reporting COVID-19 as an underlying cause of death in some countries, so over-reporting. You know, I think uh, probably not. Uh, we are not seeing in the analysis of excess mortality uh, any real examples where reported deaths are larger than excess mortality. Now, excess mortality includes the effects of the lockdown as well as the direct effects of COVID. But even then, where you know, there's some natural experiments. China did the lockdown in the whole country, but didn't really have a lot of COVID outside of Wuhan. And even then, we don't uh, see that much effect, surprisingly, of lockdown on mortality. So, so far we haven't seen anything. The closest we've come to seeing that is in South Africa where there's really no difference or there might even be a slight reduction in excess mortality, but that's just because there's a very high injury death rate in South Africa and the lockdown has really reduced that quite substantially. Another question from a dear friend of ours in the UK. Uh, it was from the region who's asking that the three countries in the Middle East with the highest projected death are Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. So the, the question is, would the model, uh, is the model currently, or will it take into account the community factors such as educational level, public response? Uh, uh, if not, how can we reconcile this? Look, the way the epidemic unfolds is driven by three groups of factors. One group is sort of more about the nature of the transmission process, the way societies are already structured, uh, seasonality, you know, population density, use of mass transit, a bunch of factors that predispose a place to higher transmission or lower. Another group of factors is how people respond. Do they, are, do they change their behavior? Do they wear a mask? Do they avoid contact? And we see variation in that, that dimension as we saw in the mask use and the contact variables. And then the third cluster is how governments respond. And so the task of a, coming up with a true prediction, you know, what we think will happen, it, the, the first one's sort of easy. We can look for statistical relationships. The other two are predicting the behavior of individuals predicting the behavior of governments, and, and that is challenging. 
Uh, but that's why we keep looking and testing for various things that do predict that behavior. It's why we were very surprised, for example, that the attempt to model the behavior of government putting on mandates, it turned out the only true predictor of that is time. There, there wasn't a relationship between how severe the epidemic was and when people put the mandates on. Uh, but, you know, th this is still early days, I think, in terms of understanding government behavior as well as individual behavior. Thank you, Chris. A question from Qatar. They're asking whether that sort of, they're calling it the tsunami of cases admitted to ICU uh, and hospitals in Italy and in New York. Do you perceive or do you think that such a tsunami will hit the healthcare systems within the region? Yes, I think that's the implication of the numbers, at least in some of the countries, the numbers that uh, we were, I was showing earlier, that we are now, you know, it, as long as the relaxation that's underway continues and those trends continue, we will see big upticks in cases. Now, will everybody get a New York style epidemic? No. Uh, there's clearly some factors in that relate to population density and other aspects of the way people live their lives uh, that influences just how big and how rapid that increase is. Uh, but we will see a lot of pressure on hospital systems in the region and particularly in, in you know, South Asia, I think, in, in the coming months. So a follow-up question, a follow-up question to that, from the, gra from the figures that you've showed, the projections, it seems like going into uh, uh, the end of the summer, early fall, the numbers continue to increase in the region, and the, in the middle, bless, bless. So that, that has nothing to do with corona, sneezing is, is good. So and it's the, so the numbers continue to to grow. Is that do you think that the lifting of the travel ban would make, or how much would that would that affect those numbers, those projections? Because many countries in the region are starting to even lift the travel ban. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, if you are New Zealand and you have zero cases, as they now do for 20 days, uh, reintroduction of the virus is a very high risk thing. And so it makes a lot of sense for New Zealand to very strictly control uh, you know, uh, individuals coming in because they basically don't need any restrictions right now. On the other hand, in the countries, if there is local transmission underway and cases are there and increasing, it may not make a big difference. So it really depends where you are and what the volume of infection is in each country. And, you know, the trend in cases is a pretty good marker of that. Uh, if you are a country or a location that still has very low numbers, they're not increasing uh, much at all, then probably, you know, travel restrictions are helpful. Uh, if you're already in that phase of rapid expansion, it's probably not going to change things that much. Okay, so there, there's a group of questions coming from both Tunisia and Jordan and other countries uh, asking about uh, the explanation of the lower number of deaths in the region compared to cases. Uh, I mean, we, we at the Global Health Institute, we, we hypothesize that it may have to do with the population makeup being this, uh, this being a younger group. But have, can you talk more about this, whether it's, did you find anything related to whether it's the age distribution or the type of of COVID-19 in this region is, is sort of a lesser of a killer type? Yeah, I think the, the only determinant that really is powerful that we have seen at the population level is age structure. We fully take that into account in our modeling uh, for each location because it is such a powerful determinant of the infection fatality rate. 
you know, remember the infection fatality rate for an 85 year old compared to a 20 year old is orders of magnitude higher. So it's really, really dramatic differences. Um, and so we are, uh, you know, age structure has a huge effect. So I would not attach any particular significance. We have yet to find anything that convinces us that there's something different about the IFR in any location. And the fact that our zero prevalence predictions line up rather well with the national surveys in various locations so far suggests that our, the IFR is really quite uh, consistent. Okay, we have so many other questions, but we'll take one more because I know that, that we've booked you for one hour. This is a question from specific to Saudi Arabia. They're asking whether they're, you are projecting that there will also be a second wave in Saudi Arabia. And do you think that in the region specifically in Saudi, it will fade away and when? Uh, you know, the, here's the big problem, right? Which is um, something has to temper the, the tendency for transmission. And so what are the things that can put the brakes on transmission? Well, those are individual behaviors, mask wearing, avoiding contact. It's ramping up test, trace, isolate capabilities. Uh, and then if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, seasonality is your friend up until August, and then it's the reverse. Uh, so you can sort of think through what might put the control on transmission across that sort of set of, of factors. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I think if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you are going to basically uh, be hard pressed to not see increases uh, starting in the fall. Uh, but that effect gets more marked the higher the latitudes uh, go up. So I said that that was the last question, <laughs> but there's one more that I'm personally interested in, in, in getting your uh, input on, which is, are you planning for any modeling on the impact of pneumococcal vaccinations and or BCG on COVID-19 mortality? Because there has been some talk recently about this. Yeah, so far we have not. Uh, you know, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about this. We have not built those into the models. Uh, and, you know, I think if, if and when the evidence is very convincing about that, we can build those into the models. Um, but so far we have not. I mean, one of the things on vaccination, of course, is when a vaccine becomes available, when it'll initially be in rather short supply because of production capabilities globally, uh, you know, one of the big questions we're being asked about is who, who should get the vaccine to have maximum health benefits? And, and so I think there'll be lots of interesting questions about vaccination. And then if we do find there's evidence on pneumococcal and BCG, that will, we'll, you know, we'll happily incorporate any, anything that we learn as, as time goes by. Chris, thank you so much for giving us the time. It was a pleasure for us at the Global Health Institute at AUB to host you with this webinar. Uh, it's, as I say, it's always interesting and informative, uh, you know, hearing you and, and getting your take on things. So thank you so much. Any last words? Uh, no, just thank you for uh, lots and lots of really interesting questions. Uh, it's, you know, we're so busy just on the day to day of trying to model. It's a real pleasure to have a chance to talk about what we're doing and hear some thoughtful reactions. And you know, as we put out results country by country next week, uh, you know, we, we do like feedback. And if there are either data or fundamental things that we've missed or gotten wrong, we, we'd love to hear about it because you know, our goal is to be as accurate as possible and be as useful as possible. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, IHME. And thanks for all the participants. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye.